All right, we will get started, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping, free information, so take it as you need. Uh, no refunds, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, look forward to bringing this to you. Um, yeah, there was a bit of demand on what um, on the topic covered tonight. So pretty excited to bring all this to you. So um, hopefully you can see our screen now. Um, so how to buy our first investment property is the topic, and we'll expand on a whole heap of different things to tonight as well. Uh, we're also running one tomorrow night as well. So uh, there's already, yeah, some unreal numbers. So I couldn't believe that the turnout here tonight, to be honest, how many have registered. Um, so there's obviously some, um, some interest in what is the great Australian bricks and mortar. So my name's John Pigeon, and uh, I'll be your host this evening. Toilets to the left. Uh, no. So disclaimer, um, informational purpose only. Uh, I will have some things at the end that you will have the option of purchasing, but you don't have to rush to the room and get the, the offer tonight. It's uh, It'll be available to you uh, for the journey. So a bit about my story. Those who uh, haven't listened to any of the podcasts or um, or just generally don't know who I am, grew up in a, car, uh, grew up in a farm in country Victoria. And generally speaking, long hours, no money talk. So seven days a week, like all farmers listening in would understand. No talk about money, just simple, get on with it, uh, have a good work ethic and things will look after themselves. Um, from from my point of view, when I, I went away to university in Ballarat and I, I soon realised that farming was out of my control and I wanted to do something that was in my control. And, and one thing that I understood pretty early was getting educated was definitely in in my control um, and I had a passion for educating others uh, and and motivating people and that came in all forms over the over the journey so it first started out with teaching um, as, as a phys ed teacher and had a passion for also AFL which led to some AFL coaching and and still to this day to do lots of that and then bought a personal training business but over the um, over that sort of 15 year period, I would. Um, I started investing in in property basically as soon as I uh, became a full time earner um, in a, in a place called Horsham. So I went with a rent vesting strategy. Rent vesting strategy early on. Um, so at 21, I thought, right, I'm going to uh, do this thing that's called rent vesting, which is really out of the box thinking back in then. Uh, what was 1999, I believe. So. Today, it's much more common, and I'll talk about this later, how it's actually a uh, the only option for a lot of people going forward um, into this. Um, the 21st century, um, especially in London, New York, those places, just people just don't buy property um, to live in. It's just uh, unaffordable. So um, over that journey, I, I educated myself through books and workshops and people. There was no internet in the early stages, right? So it was property magazines on a, on a, on a monthly basis when they came out. It was going to free workshops like this, um, not online, but in person. So it'd be Melbourne or Adelaide or wherever I could find them. And I, I didn't care if they were spruiking or not. I just wanted to absorb information and, and started to build this armor of knowledge where I could see what was right and what was wrong and what worked and what didn't work. Um, but if I, um, I, and I suppose I tell that story and, and my portfolio is, is simply a figure. It's, it's not there to, to gloat. It's just to explain the why and, and why I'm so passionate about coaching is because if I had my time again, would I have changed anything? Probably not. Um, the focus was educating myself and that's the passion I have today. Everyone listening here tonight has a massive head start on, on the likes of myself back then because we've got the internet and we've got the likes of online webinars, we've got podcasts, we've got a whole range of things at our, uh, at our disposal um, that we can lean into and really clue ourselves up. So uh, that's my story. So let's get onto the market and hit the elephant in the room. I I don't honestly think there'll be massive blood on the streets. Um, there's a lot of fear and conjecture out there in the media, absolutely. 
there's there's uh, the reasons that I don't think there'll be a massive downturn. Um, number one, the government don't let property fail in Australia and have not done for the last hundred years, and I, I don't think they'll uh, they'll change that anytime soon. There's a there's a fundamental under undersupply of housing around the country, and I'll show you some stats in a moment. New build sales are plunging, so we're not building houses at the rate that we need to in relation to new births and immigration and everything else. Uh, and compiled with the cost of living, um, the cost of build materials, the cost of labour, um, and and the low unemployment, meaning that uh, trades can charge more, it, it just bodes to to not enough houses being built. Uh, and that's a government issue. They don't put enough positives to for for investors like ourselves to go and invest more. They actually put roadblocks in front of us, um, and only the strong survive. Low unemployment, and um, usually with massive recessions, uh, there's there's two things that happen: high interest rates and and high unemployment. We've got one which is not in in uh, in comparison for the last thirty years is not massive high interest rates. It's just high for the last few years, uh, but we definitely haven't got high unemployment. So keep a trend, uh, keep an eye on that trend um, for sure. Out of your own interest. There's a growing population and international migration is massive and, and, and ramping up um, to what it was pre-COVID. Really good house growth from 2017 to 2022. Why is that important? Well, um, the next point of your palace is the last thing you give up, right? If we've got equity in our home and we've got reasonable incomes, we can draw some equity out to repay the loans. And, and that's dire when someone's doing that. But if there wasn't any equity and there wasn't the previous house growth we've had, then we wouldn't be able to do that. So that's our get out clause is to use some equity um, to, to, to cover the repayments so we don't have to sell because no one wants to sell their palace that they've uh, that is their security for them and maybe their family. Uh, and rates are forecast to drop as, as early or as late as, uh, as late 20, 2023. So with that in mind, we've got six to nine months worth of um, worth of hard slogging ahead of us. If we're sitting here now saying it's not too bad um, and the uh, the inflation rate is telling us that as well, then I don't, uh, that all adds up to me to be um, not a massive housing downturn. Cool. Uh, now I've got some info from, oh, I'm skipping a board here. Um, Dr. Andrew Wilson, he's an economist. He's out in the media a fair bit, and he and he does uh, does these slides better than I do. So I stole his work, and uh, thanks, Andrew, if you're listening, um, appreciate it. International migration flood, um, two hundred thousand to enter Australia, but they've got nowhere to live, which is basically what we're saying about this undersupply um, issue in Australia now, where we we just haven't got enough dwellings to live in, and uh, and it's out pacing um, basically death because people are living longer because of uh, medicine, et cetera. And hopefully looking after ourselves a bit better. Interest rates, as I mentioned before, they're high, but they're not high in comparison. We look back to 2011, the cash rate was 4.75. At the moment, it's three, maybe three and a half. So yeah, it might get to four a little bit over, but it's not unprecedented. Um, if we've survived 2011, 2012, and, and I actually remember back to that period where we had housing growth through that period of 2011. I had a property in Adelaide at the time as well that performed really well through those years. So just high interest rates doesn't mean there's uh, there's no growth in property. Um, are the running costs a lot higher than they were two years ago? Absolutely, they are. Um, we're, we're all feeling that, but uh, but yeah, we adjust and and move on, and we prioritise our highest values. Uh, net migration is surging, and um, so have a look. Really interesting to see where it's going to. So yes, they're moving to Australia because it's a lucky country and it's beautiful weather and everything else. Um, where they're going to is basically Queensland uh, and followed by Victoria, which is basically Melbourne, right? So Queensland and Victoria is where it's at in terms of international migration. Uh, we also track uh, interstate, interstate migration or um, 
that and and that's telling us that uh, Victorians are also moving north to either New South Wales or Queensland and New South Wales uh, population is also moving north. There's a little bit of trickle to, to WA and SA, but not much. Um, so essentially, what does that mean? Well, more and more population um, going to southeast Queensland than ever before. For good reason, some would say up there. Now, looking at the housing uh, dwellings that are that are coming through um, we can see that the building approvals back in 2016 were up, up or over 100,000 now it's down to basically um, uh, 60,000 in the form of units um, and houses have also dropped back from the 2021 high which is obviously the first homeowner incentives um, got that going and we're down to 75,000 so again uh, reinforces just not enough houses going on um, or getting approved and councils can't move quick enough really interesting the house price falls um, over the journey so look at 2008 uh, the, the gfc and we had roughly about four to five percent of average growth across all capital cities um, 2011 and 2000 and sort of 18 ish uh, and then 2022 there's been some so look at those percentages versus the growth over the journey and that's why the government like to prop up um, property and that's why people are so convinced that residential property works for them but i'll talk later about what type of property works better than others um, and, and we'll have a q a at the end as well so if you are asking a question throughout this um yeah keep it keep it up your sleeve or, or put it in there and i'll try and get to it um, so what's trending? As I, I mentioned with New York and um, uh, London, it's this affordability to own your own home. Now, we've got an issue in Australia at the minute, especially Sydney, Melbourne. If we're living out in, in, um, in, in regional uh, areas around the country, we're probably not feeling this as much, but there's definitely an undersupply of property, but we're just not feeling the uh, rental increases, right? We've seen um, on the Gold Coast, we've seen rents go from 580 a week to 780 a week within 12 months, right? And that's that's extreme. So rental affordability is not there. Um, that 31% of Australians rented up from 26% two, in 2006. Right, so in 15 years, it's gone 5%, which may not seem much, but it's a, uh, it's a large proportion of, um, of adults around Australia. And then the purchasing affordability, uh, they're predicting that those between 35 and 44 are 18% less likely to own a home today than they were back in 81. And 25 to 34-year-olds are 20% less likely to own than they were in 81. So what's the solution to that? Well, you go and rent vests like I did, or you go and move to an area where it is affordable so you can call your pal palace your home uh, and, and um, live your life there. So they're basically the only options um, to create wealth through property going forward. Um, unless we've got large chunks of inheritance or large chunks of savings uh, or, or uh, something that's going to inject it into that market where we're living. All right, so all that aside, uh, that's the external stuff that we have little to no control over. Uh, I want to talk now about what we have in our control. And it's very much these three as the foundations and, and Glenn and I talk about it um, for the last five years on the podcast. And um, for those who haven't tuned in, My Millennial Money is the flagship podcast and My Millennial Property is, uh, is the offshoot from that. We need to understand what our long-term goals are. So what do we want, not only tomorrow, but in 10 years time? And not a lot of us look past this next play. So, okay, we're going to buy some shares this year. We're going to contribute to super. We're going to pay down our mortgage. We're going to buy an investment property. But what about in 10 years time? Do we want our own home in 10 years? Do we want to be traveling around Australia? Do we want to be retired? Do we want to be living in another state? Do we Are we going to have kids? Uh, do we want to send them off to school? We've got to have some long-term vision around our, our own life. We've got to understand our cash flow management plan. Now, this stuff's not taught at schools and, and, uh, and everyone goes on about it, but uh, trust me, when I was teaching, it wasn't taught in schools and is still not today 
in um, in in real depth, I suppose. And there's teachers that teach it, but not as a as part of the curriculum. It's just because they're interested and think it's important. You need to know what's coming in and what's going out, and what you're saving each month. If you haven't got a savings plan, forget property investing. Um, full stop. Okay, get that in order first. And then you've got to have your emergency buffers. So you've got to know uh, that what's going to cost you to live your life if you had a medical emergency, an emergency that you didn't see coming, et cetera, et cetera. And generally speaking, we call that about three months worth of cost to exist. So if it costs us 5000 a month to live, then our emergency buffers give or take 15K. We need to have that sitting there before we start our cash flow management plan, before our savings plan, before we go and delve into any type of investing in my mind. Um, so yeah, Cara has just asked a question. Do you have a view on two better parts in the inner two better apartments? So I'm talking quick because I want to get through a heap of material for you. Uh, two bedroom apartments in the inner ring suburbs of Melbourne, looking at Kensington. Don't mind Kensington. Just check the vacancy rates as best you can and just see that supply versus demand, not just now because it's looking pretty, but what's been happening on the last 10 years. Go to SQM Research to get that sort of material. But again, we've got to think about what's desirable and I'll talk about that in a moment, Cara. Um, Daniel, yes, it should be taught in schools. Um I think, uh, and I, I talk about it all the all the time, but I think uh, the bucks should stop with us as parents as well. We should be teaching them, and and uh, and we we give over our kids from nine till three. Uh, essentially, we're responsible for bringing them up, not the teachers. So, yeah, we should be doing the teaching, but uh, it should be a combined effort. All right, first time investors. So. If we're a first-time investor, it basically means we've um, we're choosing to rent vest, or we've got equity uh, or cash that we may have saved up, or equity we've got from our first home that we're living in. So we're a homeowner, and then we're going to get some equity out to get into the investment space. So first of all, how do we get into the market? And I put that there as a bit of a, a market when it actually should be markets, right? How do we get into the markets that we want to get into? And we don't know that until we know what our borrowing capacity is. So that's the first part. Understand how much cash or equity we've got and then apply it to the, the strategy that we will set ourselves. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Can we invest first instead of buying our own home to live in? Well, that's that's the next wave of of property owners coming through i believe because of the because of the unaffordability and i give the example of okay mum and dad have worked hard 20 or 30 years they're now in the suburb that they want because they've um they, they've uh, gradually just gone from suburb to suburb to get into that blue chip location per se kids that's all they know so they want to stay in there, but they're a million dollars short when it comes to going and buying property there. So they have to go and start from scratch somewhere else as well, just like mum and dad did before them, right? We need to tell people that it's not just all roses. There needs to be some hard work. There needs to be some some grind to work through and be disciplined over a long period of time, right? And, and uh, when you look at, well, when I look back on my portfolio, the first 10 years, in a lot of times, we're actually spinning wheels. We're thinking, oh, is this all worth it? Is this all worth it? And all of a sudden, bam, right? We get some growth on one and then the other, and then the yields get better because the rents are increasing, and then we're away. But most people give up because they can't see the immediate returns that they expected when they're going to invest. And it's that, um, it's that delayed gratif gratification that we need to employ as a, as a business owner, which is a property investor. How much do we need? So we need obviously to cover uh, deposits and stamps and any associated costs like conveyancing fees. So I say minimum 10% for investing, ideally 20% for owner rock, uh, and then stamp in your state. Unfortunately, Vicos, you guys uh, get um, slugged the most. Um, New South Queensland on par. Um, Canberra's ACT's got this weird thing going on. South Australia's not too bad, but um, WA okay as well. But again, we've just got to understand what it is that we want in our overall eight-point strategy. And I'll talk about this in a moment. 
Um, and the property cycles that relate to this. So we might be sitting there saying, oh, there's been five, six years of growth around the country. Uh, I don't think I'm going to put my money anywhere, right? There are absolutely, uh, I wouldn't say bargains, but there's some unbelievable buying out there at the minute because there's a lot of uh, people, uh, whether they be investors or upsizers, we call them, um, sitting on the fence, not uh game to go and buy property now because they're waiting to see what's happening in the, the media and the interest rates and the war in Ukraine and all these sort of things. Okay. So you understand what markets are, are undersupplied, understand what markets are undervalued, and then away you go with the money you've got to spend. Um, equity, I was going to play a video, but we haven't got time for that. So um, you can go onto our Solvair YouTube and there's a video called John Explains Cash Versus Equity. It goes for four minutes or so and explains that in detail. But essentially, uh, I'll put that to bed. Some people think taking equity out of their own home is, is free money. No, it's a loan from the bank um, on the paper value of your asset. You need to pay that back over time as well, just like the loan you take out on that new property. Okay, whereas cash, we own it outright. Okay, it's yours to do what you want. Uh, and in my coaching, I talk about the best way to structure that, right? Best way to understand, okay, I've got cash. Do I use cash or do I use equity? Which one's going to be better for me over the long term? Do I need to keep my powder dry? Do I need to keep my cash there for when it's time to go and uh, pay for school fees or buy a owner occupier home or, or upgrade the new car or, or do some renovations. So again, comes back to our goals. Everything relates back to our cash flow management plan and indeed our goals. Now, so for those hardcore followers that uh, that have followed me um, and not just my kids, we did a tour around New South Wales. We were going to go to WA. It was uh, just on the back end of COVID, 2021-ish. Um, and so we did 13 weeks around New South Wales. And we went to a few, a lot of different areas, to be honest. And I wanted to treat it as a, as a holiday for the family, but indeed some learning curves being on the ground in these areas in relation to speaking to agents and um, and, and what was happening in terms of the, the local economies, et cetera. Now, if you're into numbers, you'll love this sort of stuff. But um, if we look at the annual growth on the left-hand side next to the, the suburb, what you'll see is the highest annual growth for that period, which was the 12 months prior, um, is actually Jindabyne. Now, you look at the population two columns away, and it's actually the lowest populated centre out of all those areas. Okay. Now, people in the city, and hello to Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, Darwin, Canberra, you people, um, seem to believe that it's just all capital city. We need to we need to buy in a capital city, right? Uh, what we're seeing here, and and definitely with the case of Jindabyne and Coffs and and um, probably Ferry Meadow, to be honest, is it's uh, exceeding what a lot of capital city assets have done over the journey. Okay. Um, so does it, because it's got a high population, uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't grow in value. And yes, I bang on about the top 30 cities by population and absolutely it's a great starting point, but then we've got to understand what is value for money. Okay. If you're going for a cash flow play, look at the gross shield column and you'll see that good old broken hill where I'm visiting actually two weeks time has um, a very low growth rate of 1.7, but a gross yield of 10.6. So if that was your strategy, bang, you've uh, you've cleaned up in uh, in somewhere like Broken Hill. Um, and then the vacancy rates, look, uh, through COVID, none of it was affected. So that means, again, it's a solid market, whereas the apartment market in Melbourne, vacancy rates were 9 to 12%. Okay, And, and yes, that was unprecedented, but it, it, it tells us that the asset type uh, was uh, was definitely not performing. So just so interesting to to show you some of that data. All right, let's crack into a eight point strategy that I do with my clients every time they go and buy a property. Now it's it's in much more detail than this, but essentially these are the high level points that we need to cover. 
So the first one is, well, what is our strategy? What do we want? Do we want capital growth? Do we want cash flow? Do we want tax benefits? Do we want a combination of all those, right? And, and there's and there's plenty others, but they're the main ones. So I was once told when I first started investing that cash flow pays the bills, capital growth will set you free financially. And I think that's still true today. But lack of cash flow, trying to chase capital growth will not also set you free. That will actually allow you to have to sell or, or make you sell the property because the cash flow is not enough to run that property and it's hurting your lifestyle, right? So understand the balance is required no matter what you're up to. Unless you're on 500, 600K a year, uh, you need to appreciate both of them. Class of property, growth, balanced or income asset. So we look at um, in the share space, that's what they talk about, growth, balanced income. Growth is blue chip in our world. Balanced is a good meat and potatoes, median, uh, middle suburb sort of property. And then an income asset is your broken hill version, right? Which is which is high cash, obviously. So again, different hybrids of all those three, but they're they're the high level. Type of property, very, very important, if not the most important out of all these eight. House, unit, townhouse, mini development, land, et cetera, et cetera. Now, most of us go and buy property in a location that they that we are familiar with, or we might have even grown up there, or our friend just bought this, so we're going to, right? Little respect for the type of property. Okay, I've got 400K, I can buy a unit there, beauty, I'm going to get that done. Versus saying, well, what else can 400,000 buy me? Can I get a house 10K further out? Can I, can I buy a big block with a two bedroom house? There's so many options with that. But a lot of us uh, defer to what we're most comfortable with. And I was speaking to someone today uh, who's in our coaching program and they said, look, we li I live in Sydney and all my friends are buying units and that's what they're used to. They, they, they just don't look twice about buying a unit. That's just what you do in Sydney. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those type of assets will let us down over the journey unless they are unique. Location, really important. Uh, which town or city around Australia? How the hell do we find out where we're going to invest in, right? Now, everyone's got their crystal ball and everyone's got a new hotspot. We need to understand what our strategy is first before we go and say, let's just find this location and go for it, right? I think we should have three or four different locations that work for us from a price point of view and a yield point of view uh, and for that type of asset. And then we can... Um, narrow in from there as to as to which one we're going to go for loan to value ratio spoke about that a little bit before we can go in with a five percent deposit probably with the first home um, schemes but more commonly for investing it's going to be a 10 percent deposit uh, now over the journey nine times out of ten i've gone in with a 10 percent deposit for my investing uh, for an owner rock, it has always been 20%. And that's the rule of thumb that I've used. Doesn't mean it's right. It's just what I was comfortable with. Borrow as much as I can from the banks for investing uh, and then keep the debt low or pay down that debt on our principal place as quick as you can um, because it's not income producing as such. Interesting um, uh, data I learned yesterday talking to an American who's living here uh, for six months. The, in America, and some of you may already know this, but um, they can fix their home loan for 30 years, right? So it's just not a three-year or a five-year fixed. Uh, so he's actually got a 30-year fixed loan at 3%. So all this hoo-ha about increasing interest rates, that doesn't phase the Americans. So interesting. No wonder the banks go broke over there. Uh, entity. Whose names are going to be in? Is it company, trust, SMSF, etc.? There's a, a few options there, but the most common is obviously our, our personal name uh, for tax benefits. Um, not good for asset protection, but yeah, chat to your accountant about that. And then price, what will the banks lend you? What are you comfortable with? What's your sleep at night factor? How much deposit have you got, et cetera, et cetera. So you can bring all that into an amount that you is, is going to work for you. And then the gross yield, what's my rent versus my purchase price? Understanding the before tax, but more importantly, the after tax result for you, um, taking into account is the strata, is the, is the land tax, is the council rates, water rates, insurance, property management, all these things. 
uh, what's our after tax position? Okay. And can we handle that? Right. Uh, it's really important. So we're combining all of these eight, eight points together. Which one's more important than the other? Not really any, but we've got to understand our type of property. Really, really important. We need to definitely understand our, our strategy as such. Uh, but then our price and yield are extremely important, right? The entity, um, yes, that's important, but that's an accountant's sort of uh, view on it. The LVR, if we go in with the wrong deposit amounts, that can twist us in knots for future investing. So just be wary of that. I more often than not like to keep that powder dry as much as we can and, and borrow some from the banks. So as I mentioned before, every housing market has had growth. So where to from here? Uh, again, go back to that eight-point strategy and then understand what it's going to look like for you. And you'll soon know what areas around the country you are not able to buy in because of your price point. Growth versus cash. So I mentioned before about cash and capital growth and how one pays the bills and the other sets us free, et cetera. Which, more, uh, which is more important to me? Um, undoubtedly, it's capital growth. Now, we need to understand that if we haven't got goals and we don't know what we're striving for, we don't really know. And, and most people walk through my door and say, look, I, I want to buy a property. Okay, why do I want a property? Oh, well, because I don't like work and I want to retire really and all these things. So we're using property as a tool to help fix our nine to five. Capital growth is the least in our control when we're buying property. And there's two other things that people, not, not disrespect, but just don't put as much focus on. One is buy at discount and the other is add value. So buying at under what that property is actually worth, not what the, what the real estate agent says, it's actually what it's worth, as well as uh, buying to add value to something. Okay, so it's a great concept. The, the ability to say, right, there's an old three-bedroom house and I'll give a lick, of, a lick of paint and new carpets and some nice new gardens and, and uh, I don't know, a, a new heating and cooling and all these things that, that spruce the house up as such. Or we can go structural and put an extra bedroom. Or we can subdivide and build a, another um, townhouse or granny flat or, or not so much a granny flat, but more um, creating more equity or more growth or even in some cases selling some of it off uh, to then hold our existing portfolio in a better position. Okay, so the add value concept is extremely important every time we go. So understanding which one's more important to you based on your income um, and also your long-term goals. And then how close you are to what most people call time and I call transition period. So how close are we? Well, it's if it's 10 years, we want high cash focus, don't we? If we're 30 years out, then we can be a bit more aggressive and look for that growth, okay? But we still need to appreciate the cash. What do most investors do? What do you think? I think they go and search for capital growth and, and just hope it works out okay. Unfortunately, um, a lot of us tend to pay too much for something and uh, also don't understand what the running costs are in their own life, let alone in that particular property they just bought. Don't want to scare those single people out there that uh, may maybe get married one day and, and be, be parents and have kids, et cetera. But um, essentially this life stage cycle is what ruins a lot of people or stops people from investing because uh, what they do is when they reach this stage, uh, a wedding costs money, by the way, honeymoons cost money, kids cost money, school costs money, or, or schooling in general as such, and extra extracurricular and sports and arts and all these things. There's about 30 years, at least 20 years of it anyway. So if we enter this cycle at age 30, we then get to age 50, 
and say, oh, we're just coming up for air. We've spent all our money on the kids and, and we've had a great old time and the kids are now set up for life, but we forgot to build our wealth ourselves. So then we try and rush to do it in the next 10 years and hope to retire by 60 or 65. And for a lot of people, that's just not possible. All we've done is paid down our mortgage and contributed to super, and we know that that's not enough. So we've got to do more than what the average person does. My uh, I suppose idea for this is take action through this family life stage cycle. So if you're in it at the moment, you're in the trenches, find a way to continue to invest. Now that might not be a property every year, right? We don't need to have a thousand properties, uh, but simply check in on your assets and your wealth every 12 months and say, right, have we got equity? Okay, great. Can we borrow money? Okay, awesome. Are we in a position where in our mind, we're good to go? Absolutely. Right. There's nothing holding us back then. Okay. And that's all we're needing to do is just keep uh, a check of that because uh, so many people I meet have, have wasted 10, 15 years saying, oh, we should have done this 15 years ago, but I was focusing on the family and, and I was, didn't think I could do it. And I didn't have conversations with the right people, blah, blah, blah. So understand where there's a will, there's a way. And Warren would tell you if I didn't, that when others show fear, I show courage. When others show courage, I show fear. So what's happening right now, folks? Well, there's a lot of fear out there. And there's a fair few of us uh, in my circles anyway, um, showing courage, uh, but it's calculated courage, okay? At the start of COVID, when, when the whole world was going to end, everyone was showing fear. The, the sophisticated showed courage through that period. Okay, when everyone's jumping up and up and down saying, oh, we've got to invest, we've got to invest, we've got to do all this, it's perfect, it's great, that's concern, right? Because that's when we get overinflated prices and you buy at the peak and then all of a sudden the market retracts on you. So I'm going to go to the back end of this whole uh, buying your first investment property. We want to set it up the right way. And I wasn't great at this. Uh, at the beginning and it took me a long while and I was a business owner and 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 by the time I became competent as a business owner I realized hang on a minute I should be treating property investing like a business right so if you don't there's issues you need to stay on top of your admin you should have a professional team who treats you seriously so who are they uh, a solicitor a mortgage broker, an accountant, maybe a buyer's agent or, or property coach, whoever it might be in that space. Uh, you might have a mentor, someone that you can lean into that has been there and done it before you, who's got a power of knowledge that can implore onto you and fast track this journey for you. So you're not having to, to educate yourself for 20 years, right? You should be able to know it all not know it all, know it all, but get a fast track on that knowledge to be able to take some good action. You've obviously got to have a great mindset. There's there's highs and lows in everything and there's that property is no different. So you've got to have a can-do attitude. Understand the highs and lows of running a business. So no emotion, just logic and numbers, right? So don't get wrapped up in the emotion of it all. Maybe the exception is buying our own home to live in. Yes, there's emotion there because that's our 20-year home, maybe. And usually it's a blue chip purchase. So even if we get highly emotional around that purchase, if it's in a blue chip property uh, area that you can afford to live in and repay each month, it's going to perform for you in the long term anyway. And not doing what every other investor does, which relies on the property manager to sort it, never talk to them, never... Um, get the tenant a gift at Christmas, um, never check in on their, their finance structure every 12 months, uh, never talk to their accountant about what the tax, uh, what the accountant's doing for them. Uh, yeah, I just get a refund and that's, that's all. I don't really understand the concepts. We've got to be asking key questions. Um, if it's a buyer's agent, asking them good questions. Why are we doing that? Why are we doing this? Why, where do we, where did you get that research from? Why? Okay. You've got to learn by asking good questions. Treat it like you're a kid, okay? I've got three kids, 9, 11, 13. How many questions do they ask? If you've got kids, you know the same thing. Lots of questions. That's a learning, learning, learning. Never uh, never stop learning. So who are those team? I think I mentioned them. Um, competent, strategic, sophisticated, uh, 
quality conveyancer. So we get into the purchasing side of things. We need a conveyancer in the state that we're working in generally, unless, or sorry, buying in, unless they're a lawyer um, or, or a solicitor that can actually uh, run or, or look at contracts right around the country. A conveyance is generally only state-based. Uh, experienced buyer's agent or mentor. Now, um, Emily and I did a episode last week that probably drops this week or next week about um, buyer's agent and do we need one and um, and the qualifications that they need. Okay, you can almost get a buyer's agent certificate on the back of a weedy packet. It's it's uh, dire straits out there for a lot of um, buyer's agents that are coming in charging 10, 15, 20 grand and they don't own property themselves or they're, they're 22 and they've they've got one property and all of a sudden they're an expert because they've had growth in a, in a busy growth period um, in their area, okay? So you've got to have someone in your corner that's got experience, not degree after degree, okay? You've got to have experience in your corner. Select a great property manager. Uh, believe in your trades, so don't try and do it all yourself. I've got plenty of clients that are, that are builders and I keep them off the tools. They don't want to be touching or I don't want them to be touching their investment properties because when they're working on it, they're emotionally involved, they spend too much and they're taking away from their own nine to five work as well. Solicited a deal with estate planning, financial planner for insurances and, and shares and whatnot. Okay, so we need to have those people and we need to hold good relations with them over the next 10, 15, 20 years or longer even. Admin duties. Who likes admin? Well, I'm not a massive fan of it. Um, you need to have great relations with your property manager. They should do a lot of admin for you, but you need to have a well-organized system at home, either online or, or physical. Now, uh, probably up until the last five years, maybe I was uh, had the physical form and folders everywhere. And um, the uh, admin specialist in my business came in and said, look, this is ridiculous. John, you've got too many folders. We're getting rid of them. We're going online. With them. Okay, cool. As long as I know my numbers. Reminders in your calendar. Understand when your payments are due, your insurances are due, maintenance checks, um, when your tenant's up for renewal, all these sort of things. Interest rates. When does the interest only expire? Okay. Uh, we should all understand that. Okay. We designed a spreadsheet. So I'll, uh, I'll show you at the end. Um, it's there for, for commercial use um, if you just can't be bothered designing your own. AGM. Now, when someone says oh, we're having an AGM, uh, most run the other way, but it's an annual general meeting with yourself every year. Schedule a time in your calendar. Say, right, we're checking in on our insurances, our finance, our rental value, uh, our property maintenance, our, our performance check on our team, any improvements, depreciations, and I'll sh send you a link um, to that as well at the end okay have your team uh, maybe cross collateralizing with each other so your broker might talk to your accountant and vice versa right so you've got a really good team of people going forward now you might be sitting here saying well hang on a minute john i've um i haven't even bought my first property yet right you're talking to me about having an agm what am i going to talk about i get that but i'm if you can set your foundations right and treat it seriously as soon as you start, you've got your goals, your cash flow management plan, your emergency buffers, and then once you start that property journey, this is when all of this kicks in. And if you do it right, you're staying on top of things, it will reward you handsomely and you won't need to sell and it'll, it'll perform for you long term and you continue to, to get on that, uh, that wealth train. So... Long-term planning, what do we want in the next 10 to 20 years? Write it down. That's a, an action step for you tonight. Reverse engineer the process. So if you want a $2 million home in, I don't know, Fitzroy, uh, reverse engineer the process to get there. We're going to buy a property this year. I uh, If it goes up 5% per year and it costs me $1,000 a year to hold, this is a result over the next 20 years. If I go and do that two or three times, I can then uh, roll back into sell down on one and keep two and then buy my Fitzroy home or whatever the case may be, right? So you've got to have that long-term vision to keep you motivated because times get tough if we just can, can uh, concentrating on the short term, okay? Um, oh. Go back. Uh, I think there's some people raising hands, so uh, I don't. I presume you've got a question. Just just put them 
I see some questions here. So, uh, all right, let me answer them now. Gladys, um, do you actually line up a mutual date and time for everyone to zoom into? <laughs> That'd be awesome, Gladys, if you could get your accountant to come into your AGMs. <laughs> I would, uh, ideally, I'd like that to happen, but it's probably not that practical for all those people too. But it's more just a, and I call it an AGM to be really official, right? But it's really just sitting down and saying, right, this is what I need to address. These are my dates. These are the action steps. And then away I go. It's just a, a peg in the sand that says, right, I'm now starting the next 12 months from here. Okay. If you can meet up with everyone individually, um, and you it might be hard to get everyone on Zoom at one time, but if you can do it, hey, that's awesome. Um, oh, Lucy, wow, round of applause. Um, today I have my offer accepted for my first investment property. Yes, that's uh, that's that's a magnificent effort. If I was running a workshop in person, I'd throw you a minty. I'd give a minty to the, the outstanding student in the room. Well done, Lucy, that's great news. Um, so you've been disciplined to get a result, which is awesome. Um, let me come back to those questions. I just want to round this out quickly. So map a plan, start with the controllables. Too many people don't start with the controllables. They start with the uncontrollables, right? What are the uncontrollables? Um, interest rates, governments, war, economy, um, tenants, trashing a place, right? Can we mitigate the risk of all that? Vacancy rates, okay? Can we mitigate all of that? Absolutely, we can factor it in. We can we can factor in two weeks of uh, rental vacancy in our cash flow, right? Does it matter if Labor or Liberal are in? Yeah, they've got a hybrid version of each other. So understand what's happening in your backyard long before you look outside uh, to, to see what's out of your control. Okay. We get wrapped up in the uncontrollables and that that uh, that scares us out of doing anything. Strategic investings. Uh, so mini developments, add value, buy discount, all these things that I spoke about before, we can not do first time. Most of us aren't ready to do it the first time, but build up to that sort of stuff. And that's where a lot of the cream lies. Okay, Sophisticated investors are, are doing that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, and revert back to the four pillars. Now, I haven't mentioned the four pillars, but I, I've mentioned on the podcast a thousand times. Principal place of residence, pay down that debt as quick as we can. Cash, increase our cash. Assets, increase our assets. Super, shares, um, business, and investment properties. And then reduce our tax. There are four pillars. Every 12 months in our AGM, we're assessing what are we doing in all four of those areas. If we reduce our mortgage, increase our cash, increase our assets, reduce our tax every year for the next 30 years, you won't need me or anyone else in your corner because you'll be financially free. No doubt about that. Um, even if you make a few mistakes, it's like your health and fitness. Every 12 months, you're assessing, right, do I need to eat better? Do I need to train harder? Do I need to train more often? Right, If you're doing that, you're going to be a healthy person. Do I need more sleep? right? So anything that we apply attention to, we'll get some results. Now, the thing that got me into property 20 years, 25 years ago was the fact that I enjoyed it. I understood it. I loved it. Uh, and I still love it, right? So you've got to do something that you enjoy. All right. Um, okay. Put the Q and A's, uh, put, put any questions in there. Um, I'll also give you the depreciator link and the insurance. Um, yes, depreciator do pay me a referral free up front. Um, so just uh, be aware of that. Um, but Terry Shear, no referral. Okay, this is what I'm excited about. Um, so some of you may know I've got a 12 month uh, coaching course. Um, it's the, I suppose, the Rolls Royce of what I call my coaching program. It's 12 months, one-on-one, um, -on -one, and we have one-on-one -on -one meetings. We have extensive um, action steps, and it's just a whole hand-holding exercise for the for the, that 12 months period. And we buy properties and or a property at least. Okay, so that's not affordable for everyone. So we've now designed um, a 
online property coach version of that. Okay, so it's it's a lot of information in respect to to um, videos. Uh, it's it's a whole heap of um, our tools and resources that our full coaching program gets, but um, this basically has no one-on-one -on -one involvement from myself. It's just an online program that we've uh, we've set in motion. Okay, so it's a very small monthly fee. Um, it's going to be launching in about probably six weeks, I would say at this stage, if our developers are on on task. If not, it'll be sixteen weeks. Um, but yeah, click um, take a photo of the QR code there to register interest, and you'll be then on that database to. Um, see the regular updates on that so uh yeah we're pretty excited about that because uh, i don't think there's enough affordable good information out there for people um all right so that is that uh the solve air smorgasbord and i'm coming back to the questions by the way i won't leave you hanging as many as i can anyway um clarity call solve air online academy work at your own pace property analyzer calculator analyze up to five properties in your portfolio Property Management Tracker, which is the one I spoke about before. Advanced Property Masterclass, if you want to be a developer, that's um, that's an option for you. One-on-one uh, -on -one property coaching, I mentioned before. And obviously, we're a buyer's agent service as well. Um, pretty much running most of the country. Well, when I say running, I mean finding property in Victoria, New South Wales, um, Queensland, and South Australia, a little bit of ACT, and also WA now as well. So, yeah, we've got um, most areas covered that are decent uh, enough. Uh, if you want info on any of those, you'll get an email um, automated probably tonight or tomorrow anyway with all this. But again, um, take a photo of the QR code to um, check out any of that stuff. All right. So, uh, Eric, if we were to buy a location where we don't live nearby, how do we find a property manager? We had discussions in M3 Facebook on a bad property manager, how to avoid getting a bad one. Good one, Eric. So we no different to when we have one local, you might just have a coffee with them. That's all. So let's get a Zoom happening with them. Uh, us maybe have five questions or 10 questions that we have for each property manager and interview five or six of them go to rate my agent and see what the best property managers are in that particular postcode. Uh, you may make one visit to the area just to, to check them out if you want to, if that's your sleep at night factor. Um, but yeah, I think a bad tenant is a bad property manager. So if you, if you get some eerie feelings about them, um, gut feels pretty good as well, but you generally need to move them on quickly. Okay, and, and stay on them if we're, uh, as I said before, we're a business owner. So stay on them, keep them honest. Uh, Meredith, what is the best place to do research on location? Sort of factors you consider? Good question. Uh, anywhere and everywhere. So we've got ABS. We use a lot of census data. Uh, we use SQM research for vacancy rates. We use um, RP data, which is a paid subscription. We use uh, Real Estate Investor, which is another paid subscription. We use a lot of council uh, websites and information. We use a lot of state government stuff, which is generally all free. It just takes time to read through the, the weeds. Uh, we use um, some bank uh, data as well. So we get a lot of those reports. So um, yeah, the real detailed stuff, unfortunately, uh, Meredith, I'd say you do have to pay for it um, in, in terms of that. But in, in respect to locations, again, if you work that eight-point strategy for you and see what your price point is, and then understand that generally houses perform better than units, um, you, and, and the yield is, or, or what sort of yield you need, you've got conquered, then you can shortlist those locations. And then you can sort of start to go deep in those locations that potentially going to work for you. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a tough one to understand, especially if you're first time around. And that's why people do like buyers agents because they've invested in those areas before. They've got good relations with agents and they can tell you what's right and what's wrong about it um, and, and save the hassle. To be honest, like I, I've we've had a buyers agent business. I get it. Um, but knowledge is power. Absolutely. But if I was first time around again, I would use a buyers agent for the knowledge and I, hopefully they're giving you knowledge. Um, but also the ability to, to just have a stress-free process where you can learn, but don't have to be in the trenches questioning your own decision. 
Okay. Uh, LJ, I think that's how I pronounce it. Sorry if I didn't. Can you please give a brief explanation on positive versus negative cash flow, pros and cons for both? Okay, so in all, in general, uh, a quick summary, and I've got a video on my Solver YouTube, but positive cash flow is after tax, it's costing you nothing to hold. Um, negative cash flow is it's costing you money out of your own pocket. So high, high level is, okay, if it's costing, if I'm getting $25,000 a year in rent, and the properties, after all the expenses, are costing me twenty six thousand. Then that's negative cash flow. If it's if it's giving me thirty thousand in income and twenty six in costs, then it's positive cash flow. That that's probably enough, really, that you need to know there. But the key is not just the the before tax, but we need to know the after tax because you could be paying forty five cents in the dollar and claiming all your running costs back at forty five cents. Whereas I could be only claiming it back at 30 cents in the dollar. So there's a big difference when it comes to that. Uh, Krithi, not a question, but some feedback on webinar. Not Love the choice of color. Not sure intentional. Reminds me of $100 notes. <laughs> Very fitting and motivating. Uh, wasn't intentional. I think uh, I think that's our marketing <laughs> doing that. Uh, it's our sole wear color, I think. Dan, is it worth setting up SMSF to invest? I would say no. Uh, unless we've got a massive chuckload of money, probably 300000 or more. Uh, Emily, how do you get an understanding of expected running costs, general rule of thumb? Uh, you can look at a property. General maintenance is a hard one, but after you get the building and pest, you probably could get a, an idea of what it might cost to, to do some things up over the next um, few years. Um, turning the PPR into an IP an investment property in June, change the mortgage or leave as is. I would generally say it's an attractive offer, keeping it, isn't it, the lower interest rate? Um, so it depends on your structure as to what you're doing next with that money. So, yeah, I need to expand on that, unfortunately. How do you know if you're buying a discount? Uh, well, just look at comparable sales in the area. All right. Um, yeah, real sales. Uh, Jared, hey, John, great session. Thanks, Jared. I met, I know Glenn's met Dave Ramsey. What do you think of Dave's advice paying cash for investment property and snowballing your accumulation of property? Near impossible. Yep, it is impossible in Australia. You can't do it um, <laughs> unless you've got a truckload of cash. But uh, as I said, America's rules are different. You've got a 30 year fixed rate at 3%. You can do what you want, right? Um, and and pay it down at your own pace. So the the rules are different. So you can't compare Dave to Australia. Sorry, Dave. Um, why do you only need ten percent deposit for investment versus twenty? It's because of the tax benefits. Uh, yeah, just borrowing more money um, from the banks, which gives you tax benefits if it's an investment. Um, but also, it's a non-income producing asset. The owner rock. Um, so yeah, essentially it's tax benefits, but it's also keeping your cash dry for your owner rock instead of putting it all into your investment. So yeah, we, we do a lot of that stuff in our, our clarity calls um, as well. Um, all right. A couple more, Christopher, how much equity would you require to avoid using any cash at all for an investment property? Good question. 500 K property, 10% plus stamp, 75 K allow maybe 80. Um, that should be enough depending on your purchase price. Really Christopher. Kruthi, this is an accountant's uh, answer, I suppose, but is the cost of a BA tax deductible on an investment property? Um, it, it's a good question. And it's definitely an answer for uh, a question for an accountant. Um, it, it's if you using the buyer's agent or, or sorry, paying for the fee using equity and that equity is associated with the with the property, um, then it may actually all be rolled into one. So I, I don't know. Check with your accountant on that one. Um, if you're paying cash for it, I'd probably say no. I don't think that should be the reason for using one or not. Um, however, it's um, it's a it's a case of an investment, not a not a um, a burden, so to speak. Um, Beth, would you ever consider buying a one better as a first place to live in than maybe rent it out? Oh, Beth, I'd consider it for about five seconds. Um, no, I think um, it's, a, it's a tough one. It's just when you look over the journey, and I mean 
journey, like 20 years, 30 years, one betters just don't perform. Um, and I know because I had one, right? I actually still got it. I just, I, I just, um, you've reminded me of it and it's given me annoyance creeps. But um, yeah, I just, you got to think about who buys real estate. Who's the common person or people that buy real estate? They're upsizers or their families, aren't they? So they need three bedrooms generally. Uh, Eleanor, what sort of things can be covered in a clarity call? Whoa. Any of your roadblocks, Eleanor? Um, how appropriate, how detailed? Uh, when, sorry, when is it appropriate? When you've got the roadblocks that's preventing you from moving forward. Um, I would say if, you, if you're coming looking for a property, you need to know your borrowing capacity so we can go detailed into that. Um, now, we, we might not get to the point where, okay, Eleanor, go and buy here and look for this year and look for this property and talk to this agent. But we could definitely, I definitely give you a lot of parameters around what to do and what not to do, which gives you enough action step. Um, if you, yeah, so just um, uh, click on the link there or the QR code. <clears throat> Um, yeah, before you, after your capacity. Uh, could you give an example of when you would choose cash flow as your strategy? When you're low income, when you're only single income and need extra cash in your life, when you're transitioning to retirement, you need higher cash to fund and replace your income. They're probably the main examples. Um, yeah, I, I know it's a hard one to understand that one, but um, but yeah, they're probably the main ones for cash. Tend to find some bargains through here. Have not bought something yet. Would you trust this site? Real estate. No, nah, no. Nah, haven't really spent much time in there, Cam. Sorry. Um, buyer's agent, Daniel. We're building towards an investment property. You'll have 100% be using an agent to do this, both from an education viewpoint, a lowered stress. Same theory as using a broker to do the finance side. Good point, Daniel. James, first homeowner, not now dream home, looking to buy an investment, eventually upgrade to a dream house. How should any equity that gets built up be used to achieve this? Uh, this is a good one, James. Um, now, with this, I I want to use cash, right? I want to use cash to buy my own rock. So if we've got an investment property now, um, we want to keep that equity for investment purposes. So side by side, we're wanting to build the investment side and build up the cash side, the cash side for our owner occupier or our dream home. Now, there might be a period in 10 years, James, and I don't know your timeframes, but you might actually sell down on two properties to fund your principal place of residence and keep the other property or the other two or how many you've got. That's the beauty of having multiple properties is you've got choices, okay? Because property is such a big beast, um, you just don't want one big one because then you've got no wiggle room as such. So that's my thoughts on that one. But yeah, great question. We I, I do get that a lot. Uh, Dean, how do you go about forecasting capital growth and rental yield on potential investment property? Forecasting capital growth is near on impossible to, to get exactly right, uh, but we can look historically at what's performed and we can see the value for money on certain assets. So don't look at the suburb as such or the the town or the city or the, the type even. Look at the property at hand that you're looking at. It, it needs to be really micro when we're looking at putting in offers and things like that, okay? Um, but forecasting capital growth, extremely hard. Know that houses roughly 7% over the journey, but that's a, a that's an average figure over capital cities. We might have Sydney doing 12%, Melbourne doing 11%, Darwin doing 2%, right? So it, it, it all fluctuates um, and, and it does take years and years to understand uh, the ebbs and flows on that. Uh, anonymous, do you pick? Do you need to pick a buyer's agent that is an expert in a small area as they'll have an on the ground understanding of that area, or is it all database so you can pick an agent who covers the whole east coast, all of Australia? Yeah, look, uh, my, I'm a bit biased on this one, but definitely you don't need a buyer's agent on the ground for investment properties. You, you do, I think you do to buy your own rock, um, but definitely to for investment purposes, a lot of it's data without emotion having good relations with agents is key. So the buyer's agent needs to have that. That's for sure. Yeah. But uh, very much data. 
Um, how do you know what the rent will go for in calculating yields? You ring the real estate agent and ask them or get them to get an appraisal. Establish property versus building new off the plan. New off the plan is a bit of a, a, a nightmare at the minute. You just don't know what's going on um, for apartments as such. I'd probably never do it um, at, at this start point in uh, in the in the current climate um so probably establish if you want to sleep at night don't mind house and land but you again you've got to control the controllables in when you're doing that when you're building there uh when there are a lot of auctions how do you manage paying multiple building pests yeah tough on that one um just really only go for the ones that you really want um if it's your own rock if it's an investment we try to avoid auctions to begin with uh whew, energy levels are uh, are still up i'm going well here how many we've got um chris is it better to have a pre-approval from equity before approaching a ba i'd say no chris not in my instance now if you're looking at chatting with us um i i would i would have a chat before the pre-approval we you'd have a borrowing capacity but not a pre-approval page uh hey john how do you go about researching hot spots versus not spots yes good one so historical data is a good starting point page um, and also looking at the types of properties or, or dwellings that have underperformed over the journey. So higher vacancy rates, um, like we've got, say, Townsville versus Toowoomba. Now, I know a lot of people are talking Townsville. I've seen vacancy rates at 9% there. I'm not certain that it's not going to return to that. Uh, whereas Toowoomba is sitting at one or two percent, right? I, I don't, and that historically gets to about three percent, and that's about it. So, which one allows me to sleep better at night? Price point wise, yeah, Townsville's a bit cheaper. Um, so you, you're comparing a lot of cities versus cities and and country and towns versus towns to to form your assessment of an area, which again does take a lot of time. If, if we're passionate about it, absolutely, we can really sink our teeth into it, get good at it. Uh, Ruth, uh, transition to retirement, how far are we talking? Well, pretty much, Ruth, when my kids are out of the house, that's when I'm done, I'd say. Um, so, <laughs> no, I, it's whenever you feel. I, I think you should be transitioning 10 years out um, is your plan to know that you can realistically do it 10 years out as well as the other thing. So reverse engineer it 10 years from it, and then you might realise, hang on, I might need 15. Um, yeah. Uh, same question there. Depreciation on new premise versus no depreciation on established. Yeah, it's, it's a question for another day, Daniel. I think that one, it's um, it's a tough one because there's so many factors to go into there. Um, yeah, oh, actually, what I need to do is give you those links. I don't know if you guys can hear the rain here, but it's raining. Um, okay, so this might not be a very good. All right. Oh, where's my chat here? Okay, so I'm just going to put the depreciator link in there. Uh, for anyone who wants a depreciation schedule, thanks, Daniel, for reminding me of that. <laughs> and that is, no, that's not it. I'll give you the Terry Shear one for insurance as well. Um, for those first timers that haven't used it, I think it's awesome. And you get multiple policy discounts, which is handy as well. Okay. Um, I just realized now you can all chat, by the way. <laughs> um, so the chat room's open. Now, uh, stop share. Okay. Now, where are we? Okay. Uh, hi, John. Would you recommend increasing LVR from 80 to 90 on an investment to use more equity for a PPR? Probably not uh, because it's getting bad debt. Oh, sorry, it's getting equity out for bad debt uh, because it's your PPR. Um, if you've got a, if you've got a really good 
cash flow system and you can pay down your mortgage quickly, then there's an exception. And it's maybe the difference between getting you into the, the Taj Mahal that'll do you for 30 years in an amazing blue chip location, then I could wear it, but it's not my ideal. How long does it take you to save that extra 10% Tim? I'd be asking myself. Um, yeah, it's, it's reluctancy, I would say. Thomas, what literature do you recommend for first-time home asset buyers? Thoughts on relevancy of texts like Rich Dad Poor Dad in today's climate? Yeah, look, uh, I love Rich Dad Poor Dad. I haven't read written it. Uh, I haven't read it for probably fifteen years, uh, so I don't know if it's um, relevant today. But you know what? It, it's motivational, and whatever you can put in front of yourself or kids or anyone else that's motivational, I'll I'll recommend it every day um better than some of the rubbish people people read um it is a bit overinflated an american way but uh, essentially the concept is very good and cash flow quadrant is just as good if not better and um, he's uh he's gone a bit rogue lately at poor old um, kiyosaki but um yeah I, I would say they're really good books and you would I'd continue I often look back on older books that are 20, 30 years old just to see how relevant they are. And so, yes, you've got to have a bit of knowledge to understand whether they are relevant. But yeah, I think uh, history does tend to repeat itself. So yeah, don't think that you need something that's 2023. Uh, thanks. Can't see me. All right. Uh, why can't you see me? Can you hear me? Okay, you're probably seeing enough for me anyway. I can see and hear. Oh, here we go. Okay, we're back. Um, if you have significant equity in your own rock, would you still only use 10% off investment price to purchase or would you use a larger chunk to purchase? Very good question, Liz. Uh, depends what you want after this. So do you want to build a, a multiple portfolio or are you just happy with this one property? It, it's, again, once we buy a property and we put our money in, very hard to get it back out versus having that 10%, putting it in, copying the LMI, it's capitalized into our loan. We don't need to come up with it. Yeah, I, I, there's no one size fits all. I would say I'd lean towards 10 uh, until you tell me otherwise. That would be my thought on that one. All right. Um, I think we are nearly done. Um yeah, so now we've got the chat room open. Um, how's that been? Is it um I know I talk quick and I need to get as much information as I could out for that hour, which is now an hour twelve, but um have we have we hit the mark? Are we are we good? Yep. All right. Okay. Um cool. Well if uh yeah, I'll probably leave it there. If um, thank you all for tuning in. It's um, it's been a lot of content, some unbelievable questions, which was great. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow night. I can't promise that it won't be similar to to say if you are registered for tomorrow night, maybe um, maybe watch the recording and just check it out. But um, any case, um, love your support. If you listen to the podcast, appreciate you, the journey that you've taken with us. If you don't listen, tune in. Uh, give us a follow on Instagram, either Solvair, myself, or um, Envisage Property. And um, yeah, you're on our database for, for all that stuff that will come out tomorrow. So if you've got any questions around any of that before you want to pull the trigger on something, just feel free to, to um, send me an, an, an email. Um, I'll drop you my email here in the chat. In dot com dot au there you go john visage property dot com dot au won't give my phone number out just yet <laughs> all right peeps well uh thanks very much and we will um yeah we'll we'll try and run these more often if uh, if everyone's felt as though it was sort of hitting the mark uh, we'll try and mix the topic up and maybe go deeper on a few things as well so yeah until next time We'll uh, talk to you.